this is Nathan Stuke, and I'm the CEO of Whisper. And uh, we have another installment of Whisper U. Uh, and this one's going to be on leadership. And I know we've already talked about leadership. We kind of did a part one and a part two. Um, but this is a part zero. And, and I'm going to try to take a, a little bit of a step back uh, on leadership and maybe take it from a, a little bit different angle than a lot of people have heard about it um, or thought about it. So uh, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Please get your uh, questions kind of ready, and we can uh, definitely do those uh, do those at the end. And I love that interaction part that we have with that. So, uh, so leadership. Um, a little bit about me and my leadership journey. Um, I I was able to get my Eagle Scout when I was uh, 12, uh, which for those of you who are familiar with that, you'll know that the average Eagle Scout is probably at like 18. <laughs> That's the deadline, right? Everybody leaves it. Um, I got mine at 12. I, I loved Boy Scouts and loved loved that because I was typically the highest ranking uh, Boy Scout. Uh, even at my young age, I was leading older people, and I, I've I've had a lot of experience with with leadership. Uh, with that, I was also valedictorian of my high school. Uh, had some leadership experience there uh, throughout my my youth and and my older um, career of swimming. I was on the U.S. national swim team uh, for three years and was uh, captain there. Uh, for the open water team, and then on the U.S. Masters swim team, I got to go to Russia for that. That was that was amazing. And then also, my wife and I started a swim team um, here in the, the metro area. And all of those have different facets of leadership, um, but it, it's something that uh, I, I've always been a, a passionate leader and always been striving for trying to improve uh, my leadership. Um, I started Whisper back in 2003. It was myself and an idea that, wow, people need internet and I'm going to solve that problem. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely a visionary. So uh, one of the problems of being a visionary is you're, you're sometimes you're ahead of your times. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it was a struggle at first for sure. Um, but I wouldn't change it for the world. I learned so much through uh, starting Whisper uh, from, you know, negative cash flow and very few customers to growing uh, to, I probably should update the slide. We have about 120 employees now. Uh, we keep adding uh, lots and lots of employees uh, as we as we continue to grow and uh, and customers and everything. So that's a little bit about who I am. I always like to know a little bit about the speakers to to know where they're coming from and uh, what what when they talk. Um, but I, I want you to define success. Uh, if you define success, you will always be successful. Um, and don't let other people define your success for you. Uh, there's always people to chase that have bigger houses, more cars than you, uh, or can swim faster than you or do something better than you. But define, define your own success and, and you will be successful. Uh, so kind of the question when we look at this, and this is something we kind of covered a little bit in part one, is that, you know, are, are you a leader? Um, and the answer is, yeah, it is inevitable that you will have an opportunity to be your every day. It's kind of like, you know, inevitable of death and taxes, right? You will have to, to, to do both of those. But this one, you have an opportunity to be a leader. There is no guarantee that you will be a leader, but you have an opportunity every single day. Uh, and then we also looked at what leadership is. And we kind of came up with some of these words, um, you know, open-mindedness, communication, innovation. These are all words that if you Google leadership, um, these are what, what pop up. Uh, and, and some of them I think are good. Some of them maybe not so good. Uh, you know, there's quite a few uh, interesting ones there, like the um, personableness. Uh, I'm not even sure that's a word. Wonkiness is what describes me playing basketball. And, and we boiled it all down in part one to that leadership is really a choice, right? It, you have to make a choice um, to lead. And, and then I went on to talk about how you make those choices and when you do with those choices. But when I was talking to my executive coach, he said, hey, Nathan, you did a great job. You did a really, really good job on, on your leadership. But what comes before you make a choice? And, and how do you know what choice to make? And yes, you're making a choice on leadership, but what guides those choices uh, that you're making and what guides that? And uh, he and I have been working for probably a better part of nine months uh, together. And I think that that kind of becomes a question. So now if you think about it and you say, okay, well, hold on, let me take a step back and and we kind of frame it up this way is if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, right? So if you don't, if you don't know where you want to go, it doesn't matter where you end up. Uh, that's another way to look at it. So um, I kind of looked at it from that lens. I also, I also found this quote that I really liked that uh, if you stand for something, uh, you will always find uh, some people for you and some people against you. 
if you stand for nothing, uh, you will find no nobody against you and nobody with you. And, and I think that's important that when we frame up what leadership is, it, it's more than making the choice to be a leader. Um, you have to know who you are and, and you have to understand what makes you you and what what do you live by so then that you can now say, I'm going to lead people, I'm going to be consistent uh, in my leadership, I'm going to make these decisions that I need to make and, and behave a certain way. Um, and, and if you don't know what type of person you want to be uh, or what, you, what your beliefs are, it becomes very, very hard to make decisions. And that's what we're going to spend today on. We're going to spend today talking about that and we we subscribe to a, a built to lead um, uh, framework and philosophy. I think it's wonderful. Uh, you guys have heard me talk about uh, EOS, the Entrepreneur's Operating System and Traction, and I love that framework. Uh, and that is a that is a really really good framework for how to run your business. The 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 how do you do it? Um, but it doesn't necessarily encompass the why. Um, so we, ha we have the what or the how of, of whisper, the whisper way, uh, which is our EOS model that we follow in the framework. And then we have the why, why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, and that's this built to lead that we use. I, I put on the screen here, a blog they have, they have some really, really good information on there. Uh, and this is what we, we follow to help us understand, um, who we are and how we kind of fit into this whole picture. And what's really, really cool about what they do is they're they're not your typical, hey, you know, here's your touchy feely new leadership thing, and you should make eye contact with everybody when you're talking to them, and then you should package your sentences this way and those things. Um, they use examples like uh, bands, rock star bands, uh, sports teams, those type of things for you to understand really what makes a, a really, really good team and a really, really good leader. And what they kind of boil it down to is they they have a lot of good analogies, and you know, what what type of person do you want to be, and what do you believe? They boil it down to a core, right? What is your core? Who are you inside? And that core uh, is, is something that's kind of it's interesting when you look at it. So we talk about a physical core, right? So now the picture here, you can see all the muscles. Some of us have a little more padding on the outside of those muscles, but we all have a core, right? Uh, we all have that core, and that that stabilizes and supports uh, our bodies. Um, you know, without it, we wouldn't be able to stand up. We wouldn't be able to walk around. We wouldn't be able to swim. We wouldn't be able to do a lot of those things. And if you have a really, really strong core, uh, you can have great athletic performance. Um, I can remember when I was swimming, I was always very weak. My triceps were very weak, and I could never do those dips very easily. Um, but if you needed me to pound out thousands of sit-ups, I could do it all day long. I could just do the sit-ups, and that was my core. I didn't realize at a time, but that's something that made me very, very strong swimmer is I was swimming with my larger core muscles than I was with my, my triceps, my smaller muscles. So they take that analogy, and they say, well, if we're going to be a strong person, physically, we need a, a physical core. Um, but now we're going to be a strong person, and, and we're going to have a virtual core. And what is this virtual core made of? Uh, and it's kind of a definition of who you are. Um, and it, it's made of a worldview. Uh, so that worldview is, you know, what are your deepest held beliefs? Wh how do you see the world? It, not right or wrong, right? But just how do you see the world? What what are you, um, what do you, what lens do you put on when you look out to the world? And I can this comes back to, how two people can watch the same news article or read the same story and come out with completely different uh, views of what was said is because that's that's our bias based on our, our world view. Uh, the next one is your identity. So who are you? Um, you know, how do you view yourself? How do you think you are? Uh, and then your principles. And I have a picture up here of right or wrong, but these are your right or wrong, uh, not necessarily the world's right or wrong. These are your right or wrong. What are your principles? about who you are and and those all build. And you can kind of see the worldview we started at a very high level and then we went to our identity and then we drilled all the way down into principles. Um, and then from there you work on your passions, right? What do you love to do? What are you passionate about? Um, your purpose, why are we here? Why are you doing what you do? And then finally they have a process for how you how you work in that and what do you do? And these are these are all part of their virtual core and their their areas that they work on. 
And I think they've summed them up just really, really well. And today we're going to go over the, the, the left-hand side. So we're going to go over the worldview, the identity, and the principles. Uh, and then next week uh, we'll, we'll go over uh, the passion, purpose, and, and process. Um, so let's take a, a deeper dive then in that worldview. Uh, so the worldview is your deepest held beliefs. Uh, it serves as an internal matrix uh, through which uh, you interpret the meaning of life and try to make a sense of it. And, and these, another way to put that is these are the I believe. And I'm going to share some of my my I believes. I won't share you my whole, my whole core because my core is my core and, and your core uh, is is your core. Um, but when I go through this process and I really think, you know, this is an iterative process. It's a work in progress. It's never um, complete. Um, but for me, I start with, uh, I believe God is the center of my moral compass. Uh, I believe that without a doubt, there is no, no, no changing that for me. I'm very, very solid on that. Uh, I also believe that God has a plan for my life. Uh, and as long as I follow it, things will work out. And this kind of rings true because I, I'm a very laid back person and it's like, oh, okay, well, we'll just kind of figure it out and things will work out and things have always worked out. I love finding the silver lining in things. Um, and, and several things, we, times we've had very bad things happen to us either personally or at the, at, at the company. And then, you know, so many years later, so many months later, I never know when you look back and you're like, oh, that's why the world, uh, or that's why the Lord had that happen because it, that was something that, that he wanted to protect us from. So that's a worldview that I have. Another one that I have um, is that uh, hard work be ta beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Uh, I mentioned I was on the U.S. national swim team for, for, for open water swimming. Um, I, I was told by my coach at, at college that I was the least talented swimmer to come through his program. Uh, yes, the least talented swimmer, a coach that's coached for 30 years, I was the least talented swimmer. Um, but he went on to say that I... I, I, I had a champion, uh, champion's mindset, and, and not in an arrogant way, but in a way of, hey, what do I have to do, coach? My, my goal is to make it as far as I can in swimming, Olympics, national team, whatever it is, is, is that's what I want to do. What do I need to do? I'll work hard. I'll do whatever. And, and that core belief has stuck with me um, through now in, in Whisper as well. Another, another world belief I have, uh, and uh, I believe that my dyslexia is my greatest strength. You know, a lot of people that have dyslexia feel that it's a negative and, and it's, you know, I'm great on everything I can't do in school. And, um, but I firmly believe, I remember back in, in seventh grade, I was two rows over and three seats back when I decided, holy cow, I have dyslexia. And whether I have a bad attitude about it or a good attitude about it doesn't change. I still have dyslexia. Um, so I, I put that into my, my world belief that I, I truly believe that uh, my dyslexia is my, my greatest strength. Um, so those are some of the things that I have in mind. And the, the reason you do this is this helps frame up uh, for your, your next part. And, and this is the way I, I look at the world. Um, and, and there's another one here that I had. And as I remember, as I said, this was kind of a, a working at work in progress. Um, I used to have this in my world belief. I used, to, I used to have, I believe, getting out of my comfort zone is a good thing and should be done more often. So I had written that in there, and that sounds really good, right? That's a, oh, yeah, yeah, you should get out of your comfort zone and try new things. Um, but then the more I thought about it and the more I made decisions, I realized that I, I don't get out of my comfort zone uh, as much as I might think. Now, I, I am pushed out of my comfort zone, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to fail, and I'm not worried about, you know, did I understand how to do something? I'll try it. But given the opportunity, I'm not like somebody out going, oh, I... I've never driven a boat before. Maybe I should go do that. Or I've never gone downhill skiing. I should do that or, or, or whatever. Those, I, I'm not always trying to do new things. Uh, so I actually took that off of my world, uh, my world view. And, and it's something that you can definitely do. You can definitely mold this over, over time. Uh, but you want to be honest and true, true to yourself. Um, so this one now feeds into identity. Um, so your view of yourself. Your identity flows from your worldview, right? So we set the big picture of my worldview, the way I, the lens I look at. And now what is my identity? And these are I am statements. Uh, so a couple of these uh, that, are, that are really good that I have on my list is, uh, I am driven to give others opportunities they normally would not have. And the way this manifested for me, we, we do uh, rocket launching 
uh, down at our land. We own some property and we have at any given time, you know, 100, 200 Boy Scouts. We do it once a year, uh, our Cub Scouts. And my, my boys have been out of Cub Scouts and out of Boy Scouts for years, but I still do this rocket launch every year. We haven't missed it. Even when I had a kidney stone, had surgery and everything, we still went out there and did it. And my wife says, well, you don't have time to do that. Why do you do that? It's like, because it's awesome. These kids have, won't ever get a chance to launch a rocket. We, we get these little kits for them, and then they build the rocket. We go for a hike. We eat, and then we come back and launch rockets all night until they all get lost or they run out of engines. And, and that's something that I, I just I love to do, not because I even care about rocket launching in general. It's just it's an opportunity, and you see those kids just light up that they built a rocket and launched it. And, and when I was able to share with my wife that this is something I am driven to do, she she backed off. She didn't give me a hard time about it anymore. She said, oh. Well, I, I now understand why you know you identify with that and why you want to be able to offer those opportunities. Um, another one is I'm willing to give people uh, the benefit of the doubt uh, in the small things. Um, I used to have it that I'm willing to give people the benefit of the doubt, and I left it like that. Uh, then I changed it and said, well, I'm willing to give people the benefit of the doubt in the big and the small things. Uh, and then as I was making decisions, right, I was working with vendors or I was working with an acquisition, I realized that I, I give trust freely. And that's the way I think is that I give trust first before you lose it. But um, that benefit of the doubt, I was actually still very discerning on large items. Uh, so the small items, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt that you have po positive intentions, true intentions, and you're, you're out to help everybody with your, your small things. But if it's a very, very big decision or there's a, a lot of money tied to it or, or something, then uh, I will, I, I don't necessarily give the benefit of the doubt. And I'm, I'm very inquisitive and want to make sure that I have a, a comfort level with the person I'm dealing with. Uh, so that's something that I kind of changed over time as well. And then uh, I am able to change my thinking about myself and others. Um, this is a, a big one for me because I truly believe in the, um, the growth mindset, not not the finite mindset. So growth means you can change, you can grow, you can learn. I know I'm a much, much better leader uh, now, 16 years into Whisper than I was when I started. Uh, and, and I wouldn't be able to say that if I didn't believe that I can change. Uh, but this is a little bit more intentional. This isn't just me, oh, I've changed because I've learned. This is me intentionally trying to go out and, and think differently about myself and be able to, to formulate things. And, and others can change as well. Uh, so that's a little bit about the identity. Those are a couple things that I have in there. Um, and remember, identity is is kind of, it flows from your worldview, uh, and it, they are the I am statements. Um, so after identity, we go into principles. And, and these principles are your strongest values that guide you on how you live and work. And, and this is where I, I really like this, um, because the principles, a lot of people say, well, yeah, I have I have strong principles. Okay, but do you? Are you consistent with your principles, or are you um, wishy-washy? And depending on you know this time or that time, you know, is a white lie okay or is it not? You know, if you ask anybody, you know, do you lie? Most people say, oh no, no, I don't, I don't lie. And it's like, okay, well, you know, when your wife asks you if she looks good in that dress, you know, we all know what we have to respond to that one. Or, or you know, there's little white lies in there. If your friend does something, you don't necessarily go to them and say, hey, you hurt my feelings and those type of things. So. These writing them out and putting them down in writing really help um, make that decision, not really for you because you've already made the decision, but give you the confidence to say, no, I know this is what I stand for and, and this is who I am. And it's an easy decision. There's no more kind of waffling back and forth or second guessing yourself. Um, sometimes it's hard when you're in the heat of a moment and you, you make a decision very quickly and you go back and you're like, oh, I, I probably should have done something differently. I, I'm sorry I did that having these principles helps you. Um, so the way we look at these, these are the I wills and I won't. And and I'll, I'll share a couple of them with you um, that I have for mine. So I will become the leader Whisper needs me to be. So Whisper's continuing to grow. You know, we went from having no employees to now having 120. We're going to end up having hopefully four or 500,000 employees as we grow. And, and I will become the leader Whisper. Uh, needs me to be, and that's changing myself, changing how I how I do what I do, and thinking about different things. Um, another one is I will give grace, um, but it will not be free. I will discuss uh, uh, um, I will discuss around the grace, 
uh, that was given, uh, a discussion around the grace uh, that was given must happen in a safe and encouraging, uh, an encouraging way to learn. Um, so this stems from, I used to have a statement on my principles that says, I will give uh, more chances to succeed. I will give people more chances to, to succeed than they deserve. Uh, and, and that was something I, I believed for a long time that I, I did. I, we always joke that Whisper is the company of, you know, not three chances, it's six chances and eight chances. And, you know, I would sit there and I'm like, oh, I, I saw improvement in somebody. I'm like, great. I love it when people help themselves and I'm willing to help them tons. And then everybody else in my company is like, no, 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 they're not getting it. They're not working. Out. I'm like, no, no, look, they're doing better. And then two weeks later, they do something wrong again, or they really didn't learn, or they weren't getting that better. They were just covering it up better for me. So originally I had in my principle that, that I will give um, more people more chances to succeed than they deserve. Um, but by writing it down, I realized, well, wait a minute, that is what I actually believed. I, I have that down in my principles. But that wasn't a good principle for me to have because now I have poor performers. I give people too much slack um, and, and I'm non-confrontational by nature. So I, I typically don't want to, to go to you and say, hey, you know, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. You know, the small things are fine, but some of the bigger ones, it's a little harder. But my, but my me putting this into my principles, it says that I will give grace. So I'm still able to give people more chances than they deserve. I will give grace, but it is not free. I will have a discussion around the grace that was given, um, and that must happen in a safe and encouraging way, in a learning way. So now I feel much more comfortable when somebody doesn't do something right. I'm going to give them the grace. I Yes, that's my principle. I will give them the grace. But I have to have that conversation with them. And it's it's been amazing for me. It's been so much easier for me to walk up to somebody and say, no, this – even though I don't want confrontation, and most of the time it isn't confrontation, but even though I don't, I don't want that, I want to live by this principle, and this is something I firmly believe in. And then I started seeing success, and I started seeing that as I approached people and said, hey, I think you can do better, and here's what we need to do, and how do we learn from this, then they started improving. And then I found out that, hey, that confrontation wasn't bad. Uh, so that's, that's a way that me having it written down really drove me to said, if I'm going to have something written down here, I, I, want, to, I want to live it out. Because uh, if I have it written down here, but then I don't make decisions that way, I, I should delete it. I should take it off my list. Um, so those are some of the I wills. Some of the I won't. Uh, I will not let overly negative people work at Whisper or be part of my teams. Uh, I, I'm a positive person. I look for the silver lining in things. I, 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 I believe that people who are positive live longer, uh, and I can see how negative people bring down a whole group. Uh, so I've made the conscious decision that I won't let overly negative people uh, work at Whisper. Now, I, I believe people can change, uh, but that's up to them to change and not me. So I'm, I'm willing to coach them and give them that opportunity. Um, but when it comes right down to it, if they don't become uh, a more positive, I'm not talking about the you know happy-go-lucky, oh, everything's great, the sun is amazing, and it's a rainy day. Um, but I'm looking for realistic people and people who have a positive outlook, and that's who I want on my team. Uh, and because I have it as a principle, I either have to stand by that principle, something I truly do believe, uh, or again, I need to take it off. Um, another one I have on here is I will not become boastful of my success. Uh, this kind of comes back to that worldview that I have. I believe God has a, a, a plan for my life. And as long as I follow his plan, uh, it'll all work out. And, and I know that my success is attributed to his plan for me. And, and the opportunities he's given me. And now I have to be a good steward of that. And I have to take care of what he's given me. And, and, and you do really well. But um, we're, we're very much blessed to, to be blessed by the Lord. And that's something that, that works its way out into my, my principles. Um, and then uh, I, I will not, this is another one that I, I think a lot of people struggle with as leaders is, you know, if I if I pay for all of this training for everybody and I invest in people and then they have to leave, uh, I just wasted all that money and all that time or effort or whatever it is. Uh, and I, and I remember back in 2007 specifically thinking that and saying, no, 2007 was a pivotal point for us. I wanted strong people at my company. I, I wanted, I was willing to train them and, and lean into them and do the best I could. Um, and, and this is kind of what came out of some of that thinking was the, the principles I will not forget growing leaders means someday they might leave me and lead others. And that's something that's super, super important to me. And it, 
it makes it easy for me to say, yes, I'm going to help you grow and help you grow. And I want you to work for me forever. I want you to be in you know, my life as a relationship on the personal side. But it's okay if that leads you to go somewhere else, because what I truly want is what's better, best for you. And, and it would be an honor to me to know that you know, if you look back in 20 years and you say, wow, Nathan, you, know, you set me on the path I'm on and you helped me grow as, as a leader, that's way more valuable to me than the time I spent or the money we spent uh, training somebody. Uh, so those are kind of the, the, the worldview, the principle, uh, uh, sorry, worldview, identity, and principle. And, and that's kind of how you start to frame that up. And it, it is a work in progress. It's not like you're going to sit down and say, oh, great. Well, I've, I'm going to pound it out, right? I'm going to spend three hours and I'm going to get my worldview done and my principles done and I'm going to get my identity all figured out and now I'm going to go on. Yes, they are all there, but it takes time. It, it takes, let me get it down on paper. Let me write it out. And then let me think about it. Let me debrief it. We all have different definitions for words. So like when I work with my uh, built to lead uh, executive coach, he challenges me. What, what do you really mean by that? And that where it comes back to some of those things where it's like, you know, the give people more chances uh, to succeed than they deserve. Um, you know, that's kind of kind of like, OK, well, wait a minute. You know that that isn't what I really meant. What I really meant was this. Uh, and, you know, you could ask yourself, you know, how how much time does it take to do that? Um, well, it's going to be ongoing for the rest of your life. If you're honestly are, are trying to always improve, we're always in different different uh you know, steps in our lives and there's always room for us to grow. Um, but I, I think for me, it, it really, it took me probably two or three months of really working on it. And, and then the more you work on it, obviously the, the faster it'll go, but, but some of it's a mind shift change, right? So you have to be thinking about it and you have to challenge, do I really believe that or do I not? Is that really a principle that I want to have? So I don't ever want you guys to think that there's a destination, right? This isn't a, Hey, check the box. I've got, I've got my, my core figured out, and now I'm ready to move on for the rest of my life. This is ongoing, um, but but it is measured in probably months, right? That to really get value out of it, and then you'll find out that as you get that value, it'll really really take off, and you won't care that that it, you're spending time on it and how long it takes because you know you're working on yourself and you're working on on making yourself better. Um, so, and that 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 mind shift that I'm talking about, it's this is personal. You have to make that mind shift um, personally, which then helps you professionally, right? Because your core and who you are is it, it, you, you're who you are professionally and you who you are personally. And they're, they're interchangeable. It's the same person, um, but you have to understand who you are. And then that'll help you make those better decisions uh, and, and be able to make them uh, make them faster. So uh, yeah, we're getting a ton, a ton of questions uh, as we go. This is great. I actually actually prefer that. Uh, so the other question is, you know, how, how do you get started, and, and what do you do? So I would recommend that you read the the blog uh, that Built to Lead has, uh, and and you start with kind of understanding what they're about and what they're doing. Um, and really, what you need to work on is taking some time. Uh, if I go back to the um, uh, to your to this core core value or the virtual core. You need to work on your worldview, right? And, and you need to work on those and say, okay, what, what is my worldview? What is, um, you know, someone, my wife grew up in South Africa uh, and her worldview is, is different than mine. And again, it's not wrong. It's not right. It's just different. Uh, so you need to think on a high level. What, what do you believe? What, what, do you, what do you understand there? What do you believe? And then you work on your identity and you work on them in this order. Worldview, identity, principles passion, purpose, and, and process. And every time I would work on my worldview and then I'd start working on my identity, you know, you go back and you, you slightly change things and you're like, oh, is that identity? Oh, no, that, that actually, that identity I came up with is probably a worldview. Um, but there's, there's a fair amount of iterations that you go through uh, to be able to, to, to do that. And it is something that you have to be willing to spend your time. It's not going to come easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Um, but but you have to spend time uh, working on that. Um, but the the built to lead it, it's an amazing organization and what they're trying to do to truly build leaders. Uh, and and the blog is a is a great place a great place to start with that. Um, so next week we're going to talk about um, your passion, 
you know, what I love, the purpose, why am I here? And then kind of the process, what does it ultimately end up? And kind of the reason we're doing all this is my core is the leader of Whisper. I have my core. Well, I'm going to have everyone in my company create their core and figure out who they are and why they're here. What is their passion? What's their purpose? And, you know, I think it was Mark Twain who said it. The, the only way to never work another day in your life is do something you love. And I want to align people to be in the roles that they love, doing something they love to do, because then things things come natural to them. And it, it's it's why they're here, that that's what they love to do. Uh, and that's where we're going with all this is, is how do we create a core for myself and Whisper uh, and then everybody at the company can can has to overlap some of that core. I don't want them to be the exact same, and we'll get into this a little bit later next week on, on what that means to 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 have a core and and where do they overlap and how do they do that. Um, but but that's what we're going to talk about next week. Um, and to kind of um, uh, kind of uh, to to wrap up this, and then we'll take a couple more questions. Is um, you know, so to be a great leader, you need to know who you are first. Uh, what do you stand for? You, you have to stand for something. Uh, if you stand for nothing, you can't lead anybody because one day you'll be this way, and then one day you'll be that way, one day you'll be this way. Uh, and then we also have to develop our strong core, our worldview, our identity, and our, our principles. Um, so that's kind of what we talked about today. One of our other questions that just came through is with everything going on with COVID and, and everything, how has that changed, you know, my worldview on things and, and how do I, I look at that? And, you know, and it, it's interesting. Um, I think some things it's, it's challenging some of my, my worldview, uh, but, but really it, it isn't. And, and by worldview, we don't mean how I see the world, right? You know, oh, I see us all becoming one, one nation on the globe or, or those type of things. Our worldview is what are our, how do we, what do we believe in? And like one of my things that I believe in is I believe that, um, and I didn't share this guys with you, but one of mine is I believe together is better than apart. So I believe in in-person meetings. I, I think you pick up so much more. You can have small, small chat, uh, those type of things, you know, so I still believe, I, I know there's several uh, people out there I've talked to. They're like, Oh, this whole video conferencing is amazing. And we can get so much done and we're so much more, more effective and everything. And, you know, I asked the question, I'm like, so you're more efficient if you're at working from home, your whole leadership team or your all your people. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, well, are you more efficient or are you working more hours? And they're like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, you don't take, you know, half hour to get ready in the morning. You don't take a half hour commute or an hour commute. Uh, you don't have, you don't stop by the store on the way home. Uh, you don't have to do those things. So are you getting more done because of two and a half extra hours of, <laughs> of work a day? Uh, or are you getting more done because you truly are more efficient? And I don't know how to answer that for everybody else, but I know my worldview hasn't changed that if given the opportunity, I would still prefer to be together. I still think there's great value in seeing people and being able to, to shake hands and, and read faces and everything. And I know you can do that over video, but it just isn't the same to me. So that hasn't really changed. Um, I, I, it's reinforced some of mine. You know, one of mine is I, I believe optimistic people live longer, happier lives. Uh, I know some people that have just been wrought with fear uh, over this COVID and what's going to happen. And oh my goodness, I'm going to get it. I, 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 I know some people that have probably have gotten sick because they've been so afraid of it. Right? They made themselves sick because it was just eating them up. Uh, and I, I'm an optimistic person. Am I taking precautions? Absolutely. Am I doing the best I can with the company and, and our employees? Absolutely. And our customers. Um, but I'm pretty optimistic about this, this COVID. I, I'm, I'm hoping we'll all see, you know, looking back in six months, 12 months or whatever, that it was way blown out of proportion. And, and I'm not quite so sure it was worth shutting down our entire economy. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot more repercussions of that uh, and, and then, then maybe maybe what what we could have had if we if we had done it a little bit differently but um so i would say no that the covid didn't change it, it just it was nice i'm i'm a leader at whisper i'm a leader at the swim team and i'm a leader at wispa or wireless association so i have three different leadership roles that i do and each one of them was slightly different um but but i was able to use my core to be able to make better decisions through the process and 
with COVID, things were changing on an hour ba hourly basis, right? It was it was crazy what was going on at front. You would hear one thing and you'd hear another, but because I was making decisions based on the information I had and then my core, I was consistent across the board. And as new information came up, we would we would change what we had to do. Um, but I feel that my core really, really helped me uh, with the whole COVID situation to be uh, more consistent versus panicky and, and just kind of just wrought with, I don't even know what to do. Well, I didn't know what to do, but we were able to to use the core to make those uh, those decisions better. So any other questions from anybody? No, nope. well, there's some good ones. I worked a couple of those in there, so uh, it was good. We uh, we had a couple of questions come in and I was able to to talk about those during the, some of the slides. So uh, these are some of the books. Um, oh, looks like we may have, have one more coming up. I'll pull up these books. Uh, we'll put them in the chat uh, underneath this video as well. But these are these are some of the great great books that I love for leadership. And um, you know, do you have to read them all? No, um, but uh, I think if you're really looking at at leaning into people and 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 leading them, uh, you know, figure out who you are as a person and your core. Um, and then uh, let's see, we do have another one. So. Now two months. Hold on, let me see. Yeah. So the question is uh, on the business side. Uh, we were inundated with install requests, uh, but now two months on, installs have dropped off uh, a lot. Uh, what do you suggest? Uh, so yeah, this is this is interesting. You know, there's. Um, you know, we were hiring a whole bunch of people because of our CAF build out. But if I wasn't, if I didn't have CAF, um, I, I would have, and it, it is something we did do is we allocated a ton of overtime. We, we say it's way cheaper and faster for a short time to, to allocate overtime, pay your people extra and have them build out as fast as they can do installs or whatever. Then it is, you know, if we had hired an installer, even with our install training program, they get out in the field in about two weeks, maybe three we still would have missed a ton of that um, that opportunity, right? So we just allocated that overtime. And, and then you're right, we're in the same boat. Now they've kind of slowed down a little bit. Um, I I think that, that we have to be real careful with overextending ourselves. One of the things that concerns me, especially with some of the smaller WISs, you know, you just sunk a ton of your money into buying uh, CPE equipment, client equipment. Maybe you upgraded some towers and you had to upgrade some bandwidth and you installed all these customers what percentage of your customers are not going to be able to pay? And in two to three months, what happens? And now you have to pay for all that equipment. Your ROI is already, you know, nine, 10 months, 12 months, 24 months, whatever your ROI is. How are you going to cash flow that? And I'm very, very concerned for small businesses that don't have a, a you know, a reserve fund for that. Um, I would start preparing um, for the downturn that's going to come, that's going to happen. Uh, the last thing I ever want to do is is lay off uh, employees. Um, I feel it's my personal responsibility to manage the company correctly. Um, I, I had to do it once during 2007. We had, you know, it was kind of that downturn in 2008. Um, we had split up our, we had two person teams, and we we had split it for installs, and then we split them into one, just one person, and uh, we had two people that just didn't fit. They couldn't do the other side. They weren't going to learn it. And we had to lay them off, and it was not a not a good feeling. It, I felt like I had failed in making the right decision. So I don't believe that layoffs are the right solution. Um, but if I was a, an owner right now, we we have CAF and we're building out. That's why we're hiring. But if I didn't have that, I would be very, very concerned about your cash flow in the coming months. Uh, and I would start to be very smart about how do you sock that away? What cost savings can you achieve um, by renegotiating, renegotiating your fiber contracts or your tower contracts? Um, ride the heyday of, hey, we've got a ton of customers and that's great. Um, but I, I wouldn't think that the golden age is here and it's amazing. Everybody's going to get internet and it's going to, the demand is keep going. There's a reason those people didn't have internet before, whether they physically couldn't get it. Um, they didn't have the money to pay for it, but they needed it now with their kids being home. Or what's happening is a lot of people are transitioning away from a bad service. So if DSL, the upload was horrible, um, they're all at home, they needed it. They finally, it kind of was their catalyst to finally move off. Uh, I, I see that that happening, but but I think you're right that that bell curve is going to start to taper off and we're going to go back to normal levels. 
Um, and, and I don't know that it'll drop back down to normal right away. I think there's going to be a more gradual as people finally get fed up with their provider and want to switch to somebody that, that does a lot better. Um, but I would be holding cash. Cash is king. And, and it's something I'm, I'm very concerned about is the bad debt for all of us internet providers that took the FCC pledge to not shut people off. Um, and just, uh, I mean, we're almost at historic highs of unemployment. Um, I've never owned a business through that long of a, through that type of a, a situation. Um, I believe the internet is fairly recession proof, right? It's fairly recession proof because um, people almost need it more than water. But I don't know. And, and, and if they're not going to be able to pay, can I as a business owner s survive if two or three or 10 percent or whatever percentage of my my customers can't pay? Uh, so I would really, really look at that. And I, I don't know how much of a of a huge building spree I would go on unless you have uh, ample cash to, to, to be able to, to put into that. So, yeah, that's a sorry. That was a long answer uh, to a to a good question, though. So. OK. Well, I don't think uh, we have any other questions. So, but uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, next week we'll we'll cover the other side uh, with your your passion uh, and your purpose and uh, the process. So, thanks a lot.